I'm out here at the owners' meetings. Uh, one of my favorite trips of the year. How are you back in Philly? Doing well. It looks like it might be nicer here than it is in Orlando. No, it's warm here. It's just a little windy, and I'm trying to do this podcast outside. So if if at some point you just hear a lot of wind or you hear my computer blow away, that's what happened. Well, pretty much every time you speak, I hear a lot of wind, but that's, that's a different story. Yeah, that's just a lot of higher. Uh, welcome to the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan. Ruben Frank, Dave Zangaro. Like I mentioned, down here in Orlando for the owners' meetings, just got a chance to, to chat with Howie Roseman earlier today. We're going to talk to Nick Sirianni and Jeff Lurie on Tuesday. It's always a busy week down here or in Arizona, wherever we are. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's really the the last access we have to anybody in the organization till just before the draft. So it's it, And it's the only time we talk to Jeff Lurie pretty much all year these days is at the owners' meeting. So it's definitely an important couple days. Yeah, it is a shame he doesn't talk more, but it, it makes it that much more important uh, when we do hear from him down here. We kind of listen to, to every word he has to say. And there's usually a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, the, he's, uh, yeah, he doesn't get he, – he might get paid by the word. It's uh, always a lengthy joke. Talk to Howie Roseman for a while today. Um he, you know, the, I think we'll kind of go through some of the takeaways from that. And I know some people were wondering, like, why couldn't I stream this? When he talks at the owners' meetings, it's kind of a more laid back thing. Uh, he's just chatting with the beat reporters, kind of in a circle. Um, so it's not something that they broadcast everywhere. So if you're looking for that, uh, you're not going to hear it. You're not going to find it anywhere. But we can kind of fill you in on what he said and, and what we kind of read into what he said. <laughs> yeah, what he said and what he meant, it's its always a different thing. Uh, yeah, he, he's not at a podium. It's not a formal press conference. Um, it's just, uh, as I understand, the cameras aren't even allowed, right? No TV cameras. Correct, yeah. So it's, uh, it's good for you guys. Uh, it's a little frustrating for fans, but I'm sure you'll keep everybody posted on everything he said. Yeah, and I, I think, the, you know, one of the biggest questions that – I think fans want to hear answered. He did not answer. Uh, not that we expected him to, but we're kind of waiting to see what happens with Hassan Redick. Uh, he did not want to get into that at all, which you can kind of understand. They're uh, they're working on that, right? Like there's, uh, I, I think we can say with some confidence that yeah, they're trying to trade Hassan Redick. They they signed Josh, they signed Bryce Huff. Ah, you did. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't finish. You see, you could have found your way out of it by saying sweat to a. Oh, yeah, I could have done that, yeah. Yeah. Um, They restructure – well, that's the thing. Josh Sweat's back. Bryce Huff is back. You know, are there enough snaps for all of those guys? I mean, they could probably make it work, but I I think the more likely outcome is still that they trade Hassan Reddick. Now, clearly, they have not found the return they want for Reddick. If they had, he'd he'd probably already be gone. Yeah, and it's never easy trading someone who's – late twenties, early thirties, no matter how talented they are, just because, you know, you, you don't know exactly what you're going to get and for how long. Um, so it, it's not an easy thing. And I think the fact that they deferred that million dollar bonus for two weeks tells you that they're still trying to make a deal. And uh, at some point the price is going to come down to the point where they will be able to trade them, but it, then it becomes, is it really worth it to them? Um, the last thing you want is a disgruntled guy making, you know, fourteen million when he deserves twenty-five million. But um, at some point, you would think the offer would come in that they would say, "Yeah, we'll take it." But you know, you don't want to give him away either. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you're already at a leverage disadvantage because everyone knows you're trying to trade this guy at this point because of the other moves you've you've made this off season. Uh, I don't know. I, I think there's a chance that maybe the draft spurs some action. It's not a particularly deep class of edge rushers in this draft. That might help them a little bit. There's a chance maybe a team kind of swings and misses at an edge rusher in the draft, and then they they say, well, he's older than we'd like, but Hassan Reddick's a really proven, valuable player. I think that's a possible outcome, but uh, I wouldn't read too much into how we're not speaking on it. I think we know the situation there. Yeah, he doesn't really have anything to gain by by addressing it. Um what they, they, he doesn't have much leverage and if he starts talking about it, he might lose whatever leverage he has. So uh, I wouldn't expect him to comment until the move is, is made. Yeah. And even maybe not then, I mean, cause if he has to trade 
Hassan Redick away for a package that doesn't look good, you know, that's not going to be great either. Um, I want to get into the other things we heard from Howie, but real quick, like what do you think there's a scenario where Redick is on this team for the first game of the season? I mean, I guess it's possible. We saw with Ertz, um, he started the season out before he got traded. Uh, I, just, boy, I just don't think it benefits anybody. I think it's very unlikely, but it, uh, it is possible. Yeah, I think you're right. Then you got to worry about, even though I think by all accounts, Hassan Redick is like a good dude, good guy to have in the locker room. You don't want a disgruntled player around. It can, it can be bad for business. We've seen that before. So, uh, yeah, but there is a chance. Because I mean, that, that's the thing. It's easy to say just trade somebody, but sometimes you just can't do it. it it's you know, there's just it it just doesn't work out. The terms, the uh, the return, the player, uh, the fit. Um, so it's uh, it, it's not an it's not a, like a perfect thing where like you just say, all right, let's trade him, and you trade him. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Yeah. All right. Um, other stuff. How he said. I think my big question for how we going into this was about Saquon Barkley. It was such a departure from what the Eagles have done for so long. And the, the initial part of his answer to my question about it made me chuckle a little bit because he said, I'm paraphrasing, but our history is, is much different than what's being portrayed. I was here when we signed Brian Westbrook. And in 2012, when we gave LaShawn McCoy a big contract, it's 12 years ago, the LaShawn McCoy and then Westbrook's, even farther than that. So, like, this and thought, there were players that he that the Eagles drafted. They weren't. You're right. Yeah, this is very different. Yeah, yeah, very different. Uh, he wasn't willing to admit that, but um, he basically said Saquon's a special player. Um, you don't usually find those guys on the open market. And I thought this part of it was interesting. He said, "Has the pendulum swung so far at this position?" Basically, like. Have we gone through a cycle here where now, you know, everyone's kind of undervaluing, undervaluing, undervaluing. But wait a second. This is a guy who can be a game changer. Uh, I think that's kind of their take on it. He said this is a guy who touches the ball 300 times a year. There aren't many other skill possession players who are touching the football that much and have had that type of effect. That's true. And in the big picture, I mean, the contract, it's big for running backs, but it's not a huge contract. Um, in, in the big picture. So um, maybe he's got a point, but there's a reason, you know, the pendulum mm -hmm. swung so far that way. Sure. Uh, be, and there's a, there are very valid reasons because of the limited shelf life of these guys. And Saquon's an example of that. He's had two great years, one pretty good year and one injured year and two meh years. So, um, there's a reason teams don't want to spend this kind of money on running backs. And maybe he'll, he'll be an outlier. Um, that's what they're risking. That's what they're gambling on. Um, but, running, you know, you, you sign guys to long-term deals expecting a certain level of performance every year, and running backs just aren't wired that way. They're up and down. Uh, they get hurt a lot. They, they have mysterious decreases in productivity where a guy will – run for 1,600 yards one year, and then, you know, with like a 4.9, and the next year he's like a really pedestrian player. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out exactly why, but it's just the nature of running backs. And that's why this contract scares me, uh, because the odds that he's going to be elite, you know, for the next couple of years are not great. That's just just what history says. It could happen. I'm not saying it won't happen, but – the odds that it does happen are are small. Yeah, and look, if you're looking for a reason it might work, San Francisco is right now the, the best example of, hey, you can put assets into the position. It can change the dynamic of your offense. And, and I, I think that is probably more of the outlier. But, you know, we're talking about a player who has special ability. I don't think anyone questions Saquon's ability. I mean, in, in terms of just – the athletic nature he plays the position with. There aren't many guys who can do what he does, but there are the drawbacks. And he was asked how he was asked specifically about Saquon's age and the workload. And he pointed out he's not in his 30s yet. He's a 27-year-old. Um, and he also talked about the way he trains, but he admitted that, yeah, like it's a fair question to ask. Um, but they, they look at him as kind of like a athletic freak. 
and that only gets you so far, but I think that's the way they're doing this. Yeah, I mean, it, it very well could work. And McCaffrey, I mean, it, look, it's a fair example, a fair comparison, because he, his career in Carolina was pretty up and down. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had two great years, and I think he had back-to-back injured years. Uh, and, you know, he's just – he's been – uh, obviously, a lot more consistent since he got to San Francisco. Um, he's better than I. He's better than I thought, and that's the change of scenery. You, know, you go from Carolina to San Francisco. It, it did wonders for for him and for the Niners. So, it could have that that same effect, but there's more examples of it not working than of it working. So, uh, we'll see. It's a look. It's a fun. It's a fun gamble, though. It's because he's a fun player. Um, and you know you're taking them from a, a division rival. Um, there's going to be some trash talking and drama, and it, it's going to be fun to have them around. But uh, it's not, certainly not a lock that it'll. When we look back at the deal, that it'll have been worth it. Yeah, uh, one of the things that Howie said that did catch my attention. He talked about Saquon as you know, where can we add a skill position player who's going to have this kind of effect, and. It, it's it's a part of it that I think gets overlooked a little bit because if the Eagles looked at their offense and said, yeah, obviously we're changing scheme a little bit, we're bringing in a new OC and we're going to mesh these systems. But if you're talking about like where can they add a player to make a, a big impact, like at receiver, that's tricky because you already have your two top guys. At tight end, tricky. Um, they could add, but predominantly like you're going to be an 11 personnel and you're going to have one tight end out there even if you do run a lot of 12 you're you're still going to live in 11 so if they looked at this and thought where can we make an upgrade yeah i think running back is a logical spot and and this is not how he's saying this This is me saying this you're seeing deandre swift get paid what he gets paid maybe it is worth it to just pay top of the market and get a better player yeah i think saquon's more talented than deandre but deandre's been probably more consistent. Uh, we'll say, I mean, he didn't really have the opportunities obviously in Detroit that Saquon had with the giants, but um, sometimes the safer route is the better one. And it'll be interesting to compare how they do You're, you're I mean, he, we differ on this because I, I think Deandre Swift is a really, really good player who could, could very well uh, have a better career in Detroit than Saquon has here. I mean, there's there's just there's no guarantees and do it at a much lower salary. So um, we'll see. It's going to be interesting to compare these guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's possible with all the factors involved. I, I, I just think Saquon's a clearly better player than DeAndre Swift is. I think he's clearly got a higher ceiling. But I don't think it's drastically higher. Um, I do. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Um, I mean, mean, even when you throw in, like, all elements, like pass catching, blocking, like, Saquon's better in every – I bet Barkley's a better blocker. Um, But, you know, Saquon's receiving – I mean, he had 91 catches as a rookie, but those numbers have come down too. Now, look, a lot of that – I mean, he was with the Giants, so it's like he's coming to a, a much better situation and a better offense and a better everything. Um, how much of a difference that makes, we'll see. It could make a huge difference. I don't know. I do know. I think DeAndre Swift is I, – I just think the gap between the two of them is not as big as you think. But, uh, yeah. you, you know, we'll, we'll see. Time will tell. Yeah, the Eagles are clearly banking on it, it being a very big gap. Absolutely. Because they, they could have – they had DeAndre Swift in the building. They could have yeah. signed him to that eight mil a year uh, contract that he got, and they opted to go outside the building and pay a player more. So they clearly think the gap is is significant. Yeah, an older player with more wear and tear. Um, I mean, similar age, but a little bit older. But yeah, more a lot more wear and tear. Twice as many career touches. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's <laughs> I don't know how fair the comparison is, but. I mean, the, you know, since Swift came into the league, he's averaged, what, 4.6 yards a carry, and Saquon's at 4-0. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, 
that's a tricky one because DeAndre Swift was running behind two pretty good offensive lines. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I, I give you that. And and Saquon wasn't. Yeah. yeah, and like, yeah, we don't need to keep doing this, but Saquon was the focal point of an offense where like everyone could kind of key in on him. So I'm curious to see how, look, I'm not saying there's not risk. There's definitely risk involved and it's risk to the point where like, yeah, I I'm very skeptical that it's going to work out as well as they obviously think it's going to work out when you're just talking player for player. I, yeah. I mean, I think Saquon is a big improvement. I'm not just talking player for player. I'm talking also 12.6 per year versus eight point, whatever per year. So I just think it's not just the player it's you, you weigh everything. Okay. And I just think it's closer than you do. That's all. Okay. So you think Saquon's a better player? I think he has a higher ceiling. I think Saquon at his best is better than Swift at his best, although I don't think it's a huge a huge gap. You know, Swift had a better year last year. Obviously, he was in a better situation last year. Yeah, yeah we could keep going around and around. I think Saquon – I just wanted you to admit that if all things are equal and they're healthy and all systems are go, Saquon's a better player. Behind the same offensive line, then yes. then probably, yeah. Okay, probably. I still couldn't get you to commit on it. We'll see. I think you know we'll learn a lot. I mean, Swift could have a Miles Sanders like year. <laughs> we just don't know. But which um, Miles Sanders are you talking about? Panthers, Miles Sanders. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I, I'm. I, it's a really intriguing situation, and uh, it's going to be fun to watch how it plays out. Yeah. All right, uh, other stuff from Howie that really stood out. He talked about C.J. Gardner-Johnson a little bit. Uh, not necessarily like how they, they came back around to getting him here, but he did admit that, you know, they were missing an element of their defense last year. This, you know, kind of the swagger, or the whatever you want to dog men, whatever. I don't want to use that phrase, but uh, that they were missing that element. And C.J. And, and Devin White, you know, that's not the main reason they bring those guys in, but I, I think – it was notable that he admitted they missed some of that last year. That is interesting. And I, I mean, they were also 10 and one without that. So I, you know, it's like the way last year started, it's, it's, it's hard for me to say they didn't have that when, I mean, they were like, I don't know what are they number seven defense in the league after 11 weeks or after 10 weeks going into the Buffalo game. Did they not have dog mentality when they got there? I just think it's – No, I, I get your point there, but, you know, they also got to the point where they changed defensive coordinators because things were not going well. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it was like they were 10-1 and one and they were on top of the world. I think they were 10-1 and one with a lot of issues kind of waiting to creep up. That's fair. Um, I mean, look, I think – I think CJ was a great, a great signing. And I like the swagger he brings. Um, I'm just not sure that's what was missing last year. I think a lot of other things were missing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it was missing. You can argue about like how important that is on the pecking order of yeah. what went wrong, but I think it was definitely missing. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, I thought that was fun, you know, but it's again, then again, like when things are going well, we've talked about this, like, yeah, CJ's great. We love having him here. We'll see what happens if he's here and things don't go well. I, I think that could be a different type of thing. Yeah, and also I think there were guys last year. Like if, if Shaq Leonard is healthy and like the Shaq Leonard of the Colts, I mean, there's plenty of swagger there. So like, yeah, and, and I'm sure Devin White when he was making a Pro Bowl in, you know, he was he had swagger. But you got to be good for that swagger to mean anything you know I mean, you can't be if you're bad with swagger now you're you know jamar cheney <laughs> so man jamar taking the stray so what do you I mean, he listens to this man yeah well sorry uh, jamar that was reuben frank who said that <laughs> you know what i mean you really you, you need you got to be able to play first so i i know cj can the jury's out on devin white and his his swagger we'll see yeah, no, I, I all fair. Um, I'm looking through my notes here from Howie. I don't know if there was a ton else. Um, he talked about uh, Bryce Huff being able to kind of play in a bigger role, and they, they think he can, obviously, but you didn't need to hear from Howie to, to know that they think he can. They paid him $17 mil a year to do that. 
Uh, I did get a chance to hear from Robert Sala today, though. Um, he he seems to think he can, too, uh, talking about Bryce Huff. He said he's really improved as a run defender, which is something that like he didn't get a ton of opportunities to do in New York because they had other guys rotating in. But he said he's like he's really seen that type of improvement from him against the run, which, hey, you're going to have to stuff the run here. Not stuff it. You're going to have to at least not be a liability against the run when you're out there on first and second downs. Yeah, that's interesting to hear him say that because, I mean, that's really the whole question with with Huff is can he be more than an every other down guy, a third down guy? And if he's if he's given a good effort against the run, I mean, you not you don't want to pay a guy fifty million bucks just to be an edge rusher. Some teams do that, and uh, you know some guys are those specialists. And if you're getting twenty sacks, you can you can live with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're if you're a factor against the run, that certainly makes it a lot easier for a coach to put you out there on, uh, you know, on other downs. Yeah. And so like he did say that, but before he said that, this is a quote from Robert Sal. I'm going to read it because it was this, it was good enough to read. Bryce, elite, elite pass rusher. People want to say all he does is rush the passer, but all Mariano Rivera did was close ninth innings. So he's a pretty darn good pass rusher and he's going to be good for Philadelphia. Well, it's a good quote. If you're the Mariano Rivera of edge rushers, you're getting 20 sacks, not 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a theory that Mariano Rivera is the best baseball player ever. I don't like that. I don't want to get into that here. Best I think that's crazy. Player. Best baseball player ever. There's never been anybody who's as good as what at, at what they do than him. So Justin Tucker is the best football player of all time. Well, I think a closer is more important. A closer for a team winning World Series is more important than – I mean, Justin Tucker's never won a Super Bowl. Okay. I, you're not going to get some pushback on this one. No. All right. That's my theory. Okay. So maybe Bryce Huff can be the best player. And Mariano Rivera, as good as Justin Tucker is, he misses. Mariano Rivera, at, when he was at his best, he – he didn't blow saves, period. World Series against Arizona. We were in Phoenix when that happened. The Eagles had just played the cards. Watched watched them blow that save at the, at a Sky Harbor Airport. But that's another story. <laughs> well, Sky Harbor Airport is one of my least favorite airports in the country. Really? Yeah. There's nowhere to sit. They don't have seating. See, there's, there's seats at the gates. Not Not enough. You always see people like lining the hallways, just sitting on the floor. Well, then there is a place to sit right on the floor. What are your three favorite airports? Oh, I don't know if I have favorite airports, like big airports, because I like some of the. Well, yeah, Appleton know. doesn't. Appleton okay. is my favorite, but it doesn't count. You like big airports? Yeah. Um, it's funny. I always think about my least favorite airports and never ever give thought to my favorite. Um, I actually do like the Charlotte airport. Yeah. Even though I'm normally running through it. I do like that center area there. Yeah. That's good. Um, Easy to get around that airport. Yeah. I, you know what? It's growing on me. The Dallas airport. Really? I was kind of like segmented. I kind of uh, like that. Well, since they and put you, that sky, uh, that, that yeah, sky train nice. in. You can get from and, and the, that airport is so big. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. like ten miles long. Uh, but once they put the sky train in, you can get from anywhere in that airport to anywhere else in like four minutes. So that's that's a good one. Do you have a favorite? I think Tampa is my favorite. Oh, Tampa's easy. Yeah, Tampa's good. Tampa. It's like kind of like a mid major. Yeah, it's, it's it is. It's like the it's like in the Mac. <laughs> yeah. Um, Orlando is a really good airport. It's for the a, Ohio for... of airports. <laughs> um, Orlando is. Orlando's is, fine. Yeah. Is a really no good problems one. here. I like um, any airport, by the way, where you can walk to the rental car. That's yeah. That's a dying breed. That, like, like Sky Harbor used to have that. You'd get right off the plane, but then now they have that remote lot. There's not a lot of airports left where you can walk to the rental car. That is huge. Yeah. It's nice. All right. Let's, you, you do I'm that. I'm going to get us back on track here. And oh, yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I caught up with some other coaches today. It was good to see Doug Peterson. Good to see Shane Steichen. Uh, did ask Shane about, you know, it was funny. A bunch of us kind of got on Shane 
uh, just asking him about Nick and about the se- the way the season went without him. He didn't really talk about that very much, but he said he's kind of excited to see what the offense in Philly looks like this year too. I asked him, having been someone who collaborated with Nick, you know, how does he think this is going to work? And he said all the right things. Like he, he said he, he had a lot of respect for both Nick and Kellen, thinks they're both good offensive minds, and he thinks they'll be able to work well together. Now, you can take it all with a grain of salt because he doesn't have to be here and work with them. But uh, it's funny that he's in the same boat as us. Like, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Now, when you're asking Eagles centric questions to the Colts head coach, do the indie writers uh, get pissed, or are there just not any indie writers? Well, no, they're, they have a few here. Uh, I do feel bad for the indie writers, though, because they got to be sick of us because we used to do this with Frank Reich. And then they, that kind of died down for a while. And then they traded for Guy in Indy. And then it was like an, another batch of questions. So it feels like at all these. The league meetings combine for the last like what seven eight years. It's been yeah. just a lot of Eagles writers just taking over the Colts availabilities. Yeah, I like that. I think I think we are as a beat like we're one of the best at getting our questions to the other coaches, and then we also take the most offense when <laughs> they do it back to us, which is so hypocritical, but also very classic. Yeah. Yeah, that's Philly. That's the Philly press right there. I'm proud to be part of it. Yeah. And he had his uh, Hawaiian shirt on. He did. He talked about uh, the Kelseys and Jason retiring. And um, he said he. Yeah, thinks- I, I was not there for that. So the way this works, if anyone doesn't know, it's like every AFC coach today is at a table with a bunch of people around them. So you're kind of just milling around. Uh, so I did not get in for much of Andy. Yeah, I, I listened to some of it and. Um, it was good to hear him talking about Jason. Uh, good to hear him talking about Jason's retirement. He said, um, "He said I know he can play at that level for a couple more years, but um, also know the pounding that that he's taken." And you know, he said he'll he'll be good at anything he does. Um, he said so, and, it, and he was asked about the two of them, the two brothers, and he said, "Well, you know, Jason's been a great leader." <laughs> It was pretty funny, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's. Um, uh, he was, uh, gosh, I guess. Um, I guess BG's the only guy left who played for Andy. Yeah, yeah, because so, Wayne got uh, there the year after. Yeah. Speaking um, of Andy's 2012 season, I caught up with D'Amico Ryan's today. Really? Yeah, I asked D'Amico actually about. Kelsey and Fletcher, who he was teammates with. Yeah. He just talked about like how much he, he was like proud of them for their careers. He followed their careers even after his was over. Uh, he talked about like facing Kelsey early, um, facing Kelsey early in his career and like how much he gained from it, even as a veteran player, and how quickly he realized that yeah, this guy's special and the things he can do. As a linebacker, he's watching Kelsey get to the second level and he's like, Oh my God. Yeah. This dude's wild. And he said, you know, he got there. Um, his first year in Philly was Fletcher's rookie season right. in 2012. And he said right away, it was like, okay, this guy is, he's, he's a little different. So it was cool to talk to him about that. It was a perspective I'm not sure anyone else got today, which is fun. Yeah. Yeah. D'Amico was such a, such a class act when he was here, such a pro. And it's crazy to think like he was teammates with those guys. Now he's an NFL head coach <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, and a good one, uh, so yeah, he's uh, he's one of my favorite guys that I've covered. So I'm I'm Me so too. glad to see him having success. Yeah, they have a good squad down there. It's funny we know two, all well, three of the the four AFC South head coaches we know very very well. That's right, that's right, and that's where I guess former Eagles coaches go to the AFC. Well, Gannon's in the NFC, but yeah, most of them go to the AFC. All right, let's take a break. Uh, We have plenty on the other side. You deserve a car that thrills you, a car that puts goosebumps on your goosebumps. At Nissan, we got everything from turbocharged SUVs to 100% electric vehicles that will make your heart beat faster. Experience the thrill for yourself and shop your local Nissan store at NissanUSA.com today. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. 
Enjoy Martorano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's Famous Meatballs with Sunday Gravy, Prime Steaks, and more. Make reservations at Martorano's Prime on Open Table. All right, Rube. So tomorrow, Tuesday, get a chance to talk to Nick Sirianni. Get a chance to talk to Jeffrey Lurie. I know we talked about this a little bit last week, but what do you think we'll hear from those guys? Well, I think from from Jeff Lurie, we'll hear, oh, no, we we never considered making a change of head coach. After, after one 11 and six season in the playoffs. It's not a bad Jeff Lurie. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, I'll be shocked if he says anything more than, more than that. He's not going to say, I really thought about firing the guy, but you know, he hired all the coaches we wanted. So we decided to keep him around for at least one more year. Um, yeah, we've talked to Nick, um, but, uh, yeah, I think the Lori stuff is going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm really curious to see how he handles those questions. Yeah, and I, I think those are the biggest questions he has facing him. But I think beyond that, it's like the coordinator hires. Will he I – mean, obviously, he signs off on everything at some level. Um, like how, how big of a part of that was he? Because I, I, I wish there was a way to ask about the 2020 season when they brought in Rich Scangarello because it's like – the offensive coordinator, like it has a bit of a feel to that. Now, obviously, they brought in a higher position guy, but uh, if there was some truth serum available to me tomorrow, like that's kind of one of the questions I would like to ask. I think they sell that at the uh, hotel gift shop. They might. It's a it's a fancy hotel. Uh, they're at the Ritz Carlton. It's just so this is funny. I'll, I'll they are like the the meetings are at the Ritz Carlton. Beautiful, lavish. Most of the media stuff is at next door to JW Marriott. Still very nice. I am down the street. I'm a and a nice hotel, but yeah, they're yeah. living it up over there. You're in the uh, in the well. The leave, we'll leave the lights on for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. It's a nice hotel. I'm I'm at my hotel now, and you see the little fountain in the background. I'd like them to turn off this wind. That'd be nice. Yeah, no, it looks nice. You got a little outdoor uh, area there. But um, yeah, well, now what do you have for Nick? What are you thinking? I want to know more. Yeah, I, I want to know how the process is coming together with him and Kellen because they're like, they should be in the thick of it right now. Like they are, you know, we talked to, to Nick at the combine about what it's going to look like. And he, he mentioned meshing systems, but now like they should be really putting this together. Like, who, what verbiage are they using? Like, how are they, like, what's the actual process of blending these two offenses like? I want to know that. It's obviously the first time since they've added all their players. So, you know, for him specifically, Saquon is a big part of that. They did add a couple of receivers that I'll be curious to find out his thoughts about, uh, Devontae Parker and, and Paris Campbell, which are both, like, relatively low, low, uh, what am I looking for here? Low moves low talent uh like low risk moves that's what i was going for they're they're not like not like they spent a ton of money on these guys we still don't have accurate numbers on on a handful of guys on a um, handful yeah yeah we don't have devin white's numbers is that correct um, yeah i haven't seen it and have we seen um yeah i guess well he's i guess he'd be the main one right we haven't seen well cj CJ, we don't have CJ's numbers. We'll get them soon. We got to work on that. Um, yeah. So uh, for Nick, I want to know a little bit about that. I want to know about Saquon, and because this is our first time talking to him since Saquon, uh, and also like the the offensive line losing Kelsey is Cam Jurgens the center? Like, will he come out and just say Cam's the center? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm curious to see if there'll be competition there. Um, if if be he doesn't, I think that's almost newsworthy. Oh, it is, yeah. Because like they they drafted Cam to be the heir apparent to Jason Kelsey. They drafted him to take this spot, and I know Nick is all about competitive advantage. But you know, is there that much competitive advantage in March to not say that the guy you drafted to play center is going to play center? Well, I mean, if you're going to have Matt Hennessy compete or. If there's going to be competition to right. I'm, I'm curious about right guard. 
Uh, I'm curious how close they expect the O-line to be able to approach last year's level without Kelsey. I mean, we're kind of saying, oh, the O-line is going to be great. I mean, he just lost a Hall of Famer in the middle of that thing. Um, I'm really curious about, uh, again, I know he's not going to be too detailed, but how much um, will does, does do he and Kellen want to involve Saquon in the passing game? I, I think that's a really critical question because – if he's not a big factor in the passing game, I mean, I, I just, I think he has to be to, to, to make that contract worth it. I think he has to be. So I'm, I'm curious to see what the plan is. But again, the plan was to throw to DeAndre Swift last year and it never happened. Um, so it's one thing to say it. And I think that, I think that's equally Brian Johnson's fault, Jalen's fault, Nick's fault. It's everybody's fault. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting one for me. Yeah. And, and the offensive line you brought it up, I, I think that is a fair point that, you know, th- theoretically they could be weakening two spots this off season. Cause you obviously miss Kelsey, but if you're moving cam, like there's no guarantee that Tyler Steen will play to cams level. If it's Tyler Steen. Sure. And just the fact that we don't know who it's going to be. I mean, they seem to like Tyler Steen, but. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe we'll get some answers from Jeffrey Laurie about Brazil, how that came together, what their plan is for that week. We, we no, know they're playing. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's, it's a, it's a hike. What is it? Nine and a half hour flight each way. Yeah. At least is nine. There concern about that. Like kind of really, I mean, NFL teams and players and coaches are such creatures of habit and routine. You just want to be, in that mode where you're playing at one o'clock every Sunday. And now you're like, you're going to freaking South America on a, a nine and a half hour. It's like 20 hours of flying time at the beginning of your season. And even if you do, that's a Friday. And even if you don't play till the following Monday, is there a concern about the long-term effect? Um, I mean, I'm, that would be the longest trip ever for an NFL regular season game. Has, there's never been a game in Australia Right. How long is like a California to London? I guess that might be similar. I don't know. And probably worse because of the time change. At least this is only a two hour time difference. Yeah. I don't know how much that really factors in because you're probably staying on local time when you're there as far as practicing and stuff. I don't know. It depends on what time the game is also, which. I guess um, no, it's later. It's it's later in Brazil, right? Than Philly. No, they're ahead. They're ahead. Okay, so yeah, two hours ahead. Right, right, right. So yeah, there's there's a lot of logistical concerns, and it's a lot. I mean, you you fly enough to know how much it can take out of you. Um, yeah, you can get dehydrated. I mean, it's 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 not. You know, and they. I mean, they're they're going to be on a charter and comfy seats with all kinds of, you know, with trainers on the, on the plane, checking their hydration and everything, but it's still, it's a long flight uh, sitting in the same position and messes up your sleep. So uh, I'm curious about the concern about taking that, that, that game and that trip when, and even about losing, I don't know how that works with revenue, but you're losing the game, home game of revenue too, parking, all that. So there's, there's a lot of questions about that game. Yeah, so we'll see if we get some of that from Jeffrey. Anything else you want to hear from Jeffrey? It's our one time of year to talk to this guy. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I mean, it's worth asking. He probably won't answer it, but, I mean, obviously his son uh, Julian is training to become his replacement. How, how much closer to that is he? Jeff's not a young guy. Um, how, how much and had a, an official position for the first time this year? Yeah, yeah. That so how much is that? Last year, I'm sorry. That was a big talking point of the owners' meetings last year. Yeah. No. Oh, how close is he? How close is he to to making that change? I don't think close. I think Jeffrey enjoys it. I think he's going to do it for a, a while longer. I also think when he does when he does make that change, he'll still have an office at the Novacare. He'll still be involved. 
he just won't be there as much, I'm guessing. You know, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, but it will be good to talk to him. Um, curious to see if anything about the, uh, like, stadium stuff comes up in this. that We, we saw the, the plans that the Phillies are now on board with um, down at our home base or near our home base in South Philly. Like, are the Eagles going to be a part of that? Have you seen the plans for that? It's wild. I have, yeah. Yeah. Um, the first thing I did was check to make sure our parking lot was still going to be intact. <laughs> And it is. It is. But, I mean, curious to see if the Eagles end up either, like, putting their support behind that or if they kind of are hands off. I don't know. I'm sure they were consulted on it, I would think. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, It's going to be – I mean, the construction down there is going to be – I don't know when it's all supposed to be done, but uh, it's going to be crazy down there for a while. Yeah. Yeah, and look, like – We'll see what that finally looks like when it happens. Yeah. The, the, the plans for Xfinity Live were a lot different when they started than when they finished. True. Yeah, that's very true. I remember those initial plans. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but we'll see. And I think, yeah. Uh, I mean, I still think there's a lot of underutilized potential or there's a lot of potential in that area. Like One of my like, experience- go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think like Xfinity Live has a very limited, like, demographic, you know. I mean, there's just, it's never going to grow to the point. It's just because you're not, you're not attracting people because the nature of the attractions there, you're not attracting all ages and stuff, you know. You're, you're, it's it's kind of got a very, you know, early 20s, mid 20s, I guess. Uh, but I think that the thing about what they're gonna, what they're planning is that it's going to have broad appeal um, for all all age groups, and there's going to be much more varied uh, options, I guess. Yeah, I let you. Go. My only comment was, I just love that the first response from most people was, "Where am I going to tailgate?" It's, yeah, it's a very I, Philly thing. Yeah, yeah, which you don't, you don't care about. I get that. That's a like a family tradition to go out there and tailgate absolutely well we're there every sunday i mean sunday morning mm. it's, it's incredible when you get there at like 7 30 in the morning and like you can't find a place to park yeah and i, I think it's like you got to balance that you don't want to lose that certainly yeah. it's a it's a cool thing that you have going on down in south philly yeah i'm sure there'll be well i mean the lot well i don't want to get too specific it's too early for that but yeah i'm sure they'll Hopefully they they take all that into account. You don't want to be tailgating in a parking garage. I know that. No, you certainly don't want to do that. Uh, that's all I have for owners. We'll we'll get together again tomorrow after we hear from Nick and Jeffrey and kind of break down all of their thoughts. Um, and those will be streamed, I believe. So you'll right. be able to everyone will be able to watch those. Do you have time uh, for those yet? Well, Nick will be at at seven forty five in the morning. Right. Uh, Jeffrey will be afternoon. Basically, whenever the the meetings, the league meetings, finish up, is, is when he'll he'll speak. Don't have a time on that because we don't know the time on that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the hip drop tackle got outlawed. I know it's something the the players really didn't want, but it seemed like the NFL had their minds made up that was going to pass. Yeah. Do you know the vote? Uh, I don't, but I don't think it just steamrolled its way through. Yeah, that'll be. If be. there's, if they have legit numbers that say it's unsafe, it, it, they're going to pass something. Yeah, It'll be interesting to see how they enforce it, and uh, do we know what the penalty is? Is it a personal uh, I, foul? I have not had a chance to read into it. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll get some more info and pass that along. Uh, Eagle signed a quarterback, yeah. Will Greer. Kind of went under the radar a little bit this weekend. Uh, it, it's nothing about Tanner McKee. The Eagles are very clear about this. They like Tanner as their third quarterback, developmental guy. Basically, Will Greer has some familiarity with the coaching staff, Kellen Moore and Doug Nussmeyer. He's the fourth quarterback, a, a camp body. He's going to get a chance to play a little bit in the preseason. Yeah, somebody posted on my on my X timeline that he's – He's better than Kenny Pickett. And I was like, what are you 
what are you basing that on? Like he's thrown 30 passes, four interceptions, no, 50 passes, no touchdowns. He's like, oh, I watch Kenny Pickett every week. Like, <laughs> he didn't he, watch Will Gurr every week because he's not he playing. He he'd never seen him play. I mean, he's just like, I know he's better. <laughs> <laughs> The grass is always greener, I guess. But yeah, he's I think it's important to have somebody who speaks Kellen Moore's language and can kind of translate to the other quarterbacks. That's why he's here. He he knows what he's after, he knows what he's looking for. And he can um look, there's uh, out on the practice field and meetings, there's times where Kellen Moore won't be there. Um so Greer can kind of help the other QBs. I mean, he's kind of a a coach without being a coach. Sure. Uh, you mentioned grass is always greener. What if I told you the Eagles were about to sign a former six round pick with four, three speed who has had over 600 receiving yards in a single season. Wow. Pretty exciting player, right? I don't know. Can he like, has he had any big plays in his career? Any like 40, 50 yard catches? Yeah, he has really. Yeah, man, that'd be a steal. Is Quez Watkins signed with the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, which is funny because it's a move that like I think any fan base would get excited about if you haven't seen Quez Watkins play and you just saw like, oh, there's something here. Uh, we've seen Quez play for the last couple of years. He clearly wasn't going to be here. What do you make of him in Pittsburgh? Well, I think he has a chance uh, with a new start to um, kind of – I shouldn't say revive his career, but save his career, which is kind of um, in jeopardy. I don't think, you know, he's not certainly not a lock to make the team, but, you know, they lost Deontay Johnson, I think, to the Panthers, maybe. Um, you know, we'll see. Uh, it, he's got the ability. He's got the traits. Um, he's, like you said, he he had that really good year in, in 2021. It just went downhill uh, from there with the fumbles and the drops and just not fighting for the ball. Uh, I I'll be surprised. Like we've seen Matt Collins and, and Nelly kind of regenerate their careers elsewhere. And not like Nelly was, was, I mean, he had his moments here. Um, Matt Collins did not. Uh, but um, I, I'm just, I feel like I'll be surprised if it works out. i have just, there's something missing there. And, you know, I think he's a good kid and I think he works hard, but I, I'll just, I'll be surprised um, if he's a factor, I'll be surprised if he makes the team. Honestly. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I just um, think like you would have been pretty surprised if I told you Matt Collins was going to have a career, though. That's fair. That's totally fair. I would have, you know. But Matt Collins, I mean he he just never got the opportunities here. I mean, there was a reason for that. I mean, I'm yeah. but he didn't have the mess ups that Quez had. I mean, the drop in the Super Bowl, the two bobbles that turn into interceptions in Dallas, the the, the fumble against Washington that cost probably cost the Eagles, you know, an 11 and no start in, in 2022. Um, these are all like minus plays that I just wonder what they do to somebody's confidence. Like Matt Collins never had that. He just wasn't playing. Um, but, you know, Mac never had a season like Quez did two years ago, three years ago now as well so um, you know look maybe he can he can move on from everything that happened here but i think it'll be very hard I, or when you when you drop a sh yeah i probably wouldn't have been a touchdown it could have been in in glendale but it would have been a 50 yard play and probably set up a touchdown um when you cost your team a possibly a super bowl with a drop i don't i don't know how you get past all that maybe he can do it but he sure didn't show any signs of it last year. We'll see. And he played a yeah. lot. He, early he did. But uh, I wish him I wish him well. I think a change of scenery is really the only possible way to for him to salvage his career. Yeah, I think we all knew he wasn't going to be back here. There's no way he or the organization would have wanted that. And it was a year too late. And I, I don't know why they – I mean, I guess he was under contract. It was, it was worth a shot. But, I mean, it's pretty obvious after 2022 that it wasn't going to go well for him last year, and it, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. I think what's significant is that, you know, Julio Jones, Ol Olamati, Zacchaeus, and Quez, who all kind of had their opportunity at the number three spot last year, 
Um, they're all free agents, and none of them are going to be back. I mean, they're pretty much turning over the whole position other than AJ and, and Devontae and Britton Covey, um, who's rarely used on offense. So um, be pretty much a, a new room in a lot of ways. Yeah, quite a bit of turnover. Uh, I had one other note from Howie that I forgot to mention. He talked a little bit about James Bradbury. Uh, at the Combine, the only thing he really said about Bradbury was that he's part of our plans, he's under contract, and it was kind of at the end of his availability there, and that was the last we heard of it. Uh, I thought it was you know, notable today he mentioned that last year Bradbury didn't have the year he was expecting or the year we were expecting. He pointed out to Bradbury having gone through bad seasons before and bouncing back from it. Um, so a, a little more detail there. He said, you know, when they signed Bradbury to that three-year deal, they anticipated him being here for the three years. Now things change in this league pretty, pretty quickly. So your plans are allowed to change as well. Not sure what I make of all this. I'm still skeptical about James Bradbury being back. I, I think this could be a case of the Eagles are, trying to figure out that position and they they're not in any rush to get rid of Bradbury, but I think they also know they got to be better next year. Yeah. I don't buy the whole, like even when he had his bad seasons with the giants or his down years, they were nothing like what he did last year. Nowhere close. He gave up 11 touchdown passes. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else since stat had started tracking that nobody else has given up like more than eight. I mean, it's crazy how bad he was. And I just don't – I mean, I don't see any chance that it's uh, – it wasn't because he just had a bad year. I mean, he can't run. I mean, and he was healthy, and he just couldn't run anymore. You can't play quarterback in the NFL if you can't run, and he can't run. Uh, maybe maybe in that uh, – along the lines of the competitive advantage, they think if they, if they cut him, it'll be more obvious they're going to draft a corner. I mean, I Or trade know. for one minute. Like, it would hurt you in – negotiations if you're trying to trade for someone right right um also i think there's a point where you know you owe it to james bradbury a little bit to like look we're gonna you know i mean if they if they wait to if they if they do have to cut them because i I just can't imagine they're going to be able to trade them um you know, if it's after the draft, nobody's going to sign them. I mean, somebody will eventually for no money when they have some injuries. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's I, look. There's a chance Howie just doesn't want the dead, the dead cap money, and is going to they're going to carry him and play Slay and Ringo and Isaiah Rogers and who whoever else, and just don't even dress him out and just carry him so you avoid the dead cap money. I, I just – I don't get that. I don't think you want him around. I don't think you want a guy around who you're mothballing. Yeah, I don't think Howie would want that. I, I don't think Howie cares about dead money the way that we talk about it or anyone else in the league talks about it for that matter. No, that's true. I mean, it's never been a factor. Uh, it's never been a factor for them. It's a lot. It would be a lot, but they could handle it. I still, I still would be shocked if he's here opening day. I'm with you, and I, I can I certainly can't imagine him playing, like being a starter. I, 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 you can't do that. This is a team with Super Bowl aspirations. You can't, you can't run it back. Agree. That's all I have football wise. Wanted to give you a congratulations. Can I do that? Sure. This will make you feel uncomfortable. Congratulations, South Jersey Track Hall of Famer Ruben Frank. How was the uh, the banquet? Yeah, the banquet was really nice. Uh, I was inducted into the South Jersey Track Hall of Fame um, last night in uh, Berlin, New Jersey, at, at the uh, Lucian's Manor Banquet Hall. It's a really nice evening. Saw a lot of old friends, uh, people I hadn't seen in years. A bunch of our old BCT colleagues were there, Berlin County Times. Uh, it was great to see them. Um, it was a fun night. It was a long night. <laughs> <laughs> the speeches didn't start till after the dinner. Um, so it was, it was a late night, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, anytime you can see people you haven't seen in like 10 years, 12 years, it's a lot of fun. So it was a good uh, class of uh, inductees. Um, some 
people from different schools, different events, uh, made it fun. The 1991 Shawnee cross country team was inducted that I covered when I was, when I was covering, covering track and cross country. And I went in with Michelle Brown, the great Seneca runner who went to Notre Dame. She ran 52, 74 in high school. That's like, there's, there's a lot of schools that don't have guys that can run that. Um, and, uh, made the U S junior national team. So it was kind of cool. Cause I covered like every meet she ever ran in high school. So it was cool to go in with her. Um, but it was a really nice night and a, a huge honor humbling. And, uh, I, I'm just really appreciative of the South Jersey track hall of fame, including me. It was, it was a lot of fun. That's very cool. How'd the speech go? Speech went well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, you know, you, you don't want to be the guy that goes too long. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I kept it to about six minutes and, and most of my jokes got, got a laugh. So that was, that's that was good. Important. That's all you can ask for. I did mention really? you in my speech. Did you? Yeah. You were like, why isn't he here? He's I actually in Florida. Said, that was actually pretty funny. I said, uh, you know, I was thanking some people from, from, uh, NBC and, you know, um, Sarah Baker and Todd Berman who hired me back in 2010. And, um, uh, and I said, I, you know, I'd like to mention Dave Zangaro, my my partner covering the Eagles. Uh, he couldn't be here because he's in Orlando covering the NFL owners meetings. And I said, he probably wouldn't have come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's so good. but it was a good time. It was a good night. It was great to see. I, I just want to, you know, um, Wayne, Wayne Richardson. We have a bunch of old colleagues who were there because we used to work at the same newspaper. People don't, might not know mm -hmm. that. Uh, Wayne Richardson was there. Andy Weinberg, um, John Lewis. Uh, I'm trying to go around the room. Um, Phil Chapin was there. It's great to see Phil. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Dennis McDonald was there, photographer. Uh, so it was, it was really nice, nice event. Awesome. Congratulations. Sorry, that sounds like it. It went well. We'll celebrate when I get back. Deal. Sounds good. All right. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube please click that like button, subscribe there as well. That's it. Uh, this was kind of a, a bonus. So back with you uh, tomorrow after Jeff Lurie and, and Nick Sirianni. That's it uh, for Rube. I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you soon.